Good day, and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Enru, and we are going to be talking about some atomic models today. Just basic, basic atomic models. Okay, so in terms of atomic models, the one you generally see most of the time is one that looks kind of like this. It has, let's do some different colors here. All right, it has this centerpiece that you deal with. There, there it is. There it is. With some, maybe some more than that. And then there's some kind of cloudy area around it. Let's do that in a different color since we have multicolors. All right. It's kind of spherical. And here's my cloudy area. All right. So that general atomic model. Okay, that has the centerpiece, it's called the nucleus. And the nucleus has both protons and neutrons in it, right? So it has two subatomic particles, protons and neutrons. Protons have a plus one charge, and therefore, right, so they have a plus one charge, and are therefore designated as P pluses, okay? And neutrons have no charge at all, okay? This is different than um, what a lot of people think because they think neutrons comes from neutral, which must mean that it has a neutral charge. Well, neutral charges are loaded in, that's a loaded term <laughs> in chemistry because what neutral means in chemistry, the vast majority of the time, is that it has equal numbers of pluses and minuses. So therefore, basically what charge neutral means is if you added the pluses, whatever the number of pluses is, in whatever atom or compound or whatever you're talking about, if you added that to the number of minuses in that compound, then their sum would be zero. That's what neutral means in chemistry the vast majority of the time. So neutrons are not quite that. They don't have pluses and minuses and they don't have equal numbers of them. They have no charge at all, zero charge, and therefore are designated with an N with a zero, basically, as its superscript, okay? The nucleus is at the center of the atom. Both of these have relative mass. The amount of mass that they have is about one AMU each, and so that's where the vast majority of the mass is held. Hanging around in some kind of fashion, basically in what we call the electron cloud, is this last subatomic particle that's called an electron, or electrons, I should say. And electrons have a minus charge, a minus one charge, and are therefore designated as E minuses, okay? Electrons hang about the nucleus. Okay, how they exactly do that comes to the idea of the atomic models. Okay, so this is the general model that most people see when they're encountering atoms in some book. Okay, let's talk about how this general idea came about and how it's more specific than what is usually designated, right? All right, so in terms of atomic models, when we do atomic models, almost always, we start at the beginning. <laughs> there are some beginning ideas of what atoms looked like. Um, certainly Dalton had some very interesting ideas as to how atoms looked. He came up with his atomic theory and uh, really characterized a lot of what we know today in terms of how we believe atoms behave and what's been confirmed by experimental evidence. Okay, um, some of Dalton's atomic theory, honestly, was incorrect. Okay, it wasn't a perfect theory, as no theory usually is. But it is um, a good place to start. Okay, atomic, Dalton's atomic theory basically stated, the most important part of Dalton's atomic theory was that the smallest uh, portion, if you, cut, if you divide an uh, element into the smallest pieces, 
that have all of the properties of that particular element, that would be called an atom. Okay, and atoms, his biggest piece that he was a little bit incorrect on is that he said atoms were indivisible. They, of course, can be divided further, but they cannot be divided in such a way that is reflective of all of the properties of that element. It's kind of the basic idea. Okay, in terms of atomic models, the first real atomic model that we tend to think about or even care about was proposed by the same man who came up with the idea that atoms had to have protons and had to have electrons. And he actually came up with the electrons first. Okay, so in terms of that, his name was J.J. Thompson. J.J. discovered both, oh, discovered protons and electrons. And he really did the electrons first and then realized that some, he figured out that electrons existed because of bonding. And then he figured out that protons had to exist because some atoms were neutral. That's basically the idea of what came along. How he characterized these is he basically said, I think um, atoms look like something else. He made an analogy. And that's what a lot of people did when they were coming up with their atomic models. They said, I think the atom looks like this, okay? And what he said is he said, I think the atom looks like plum pudding. Therefore, we call it the plum pudding model. For those of you who have had plum pudding, um, <laughs> I, I actually had something called plum pudding in England, and I don't think it was plum pudding at all, because what I had was like plum pudding with some currants in it. What really plum pudding should be is it's a uh, cake. It's like a cake, it also has currants in it. So basically the idea here is that if you took a slice of plum pudding and looked at it, what would it look like? Well, let's take a slice, let's make it a circular slice and say, okay, well, a, a bowl, of, or not a bowl, a slice of plum pudding should have a cake part and it should have currants randomly interspersed throughout it. Now currants here are C-U-R-R-A-N-T, <laughs> not currants as in electricity, but currants which have are a dried fruit, right? So in this case, the cake part, he labeled as the, the proton part, it was the proton, uh, it was a positively charged area, okay? And then you had the electrons, okay? And the electrons were the currents. So protons were the cake part, and electrons were the currents. All right, having said that, this was a lovely model. Any, really chemists love anything, and physicists, let's be honest, okay, love anything that we can basically describe using a cocktail napkin. And if you don't even need the cocktail napkin, life is even better. So in this case, everyone could visualize this. Uh, most of the people who were thinking about this were in Europe at the time. Uh, maybe some Americans were thinking about it, but not quite in the same way. And so most folks knew what plum pudding looked like. So. All that she had to say was cake, protons, currents, electrons. People were like, oh, that's great. Okay. Plum pudding model was fabulous. He, uh, JJ, in his infinite wisdom, set his graduate student, Ernest Rutherford, on the path to prove this model right. right? And Ernest Rutherford, who we credit with discovering the nucleus, Um, basically came up with this really ingenious experiment. And what this ingenious experiment did is it basically, well, that's for lack of a better term, he chucked alpha particles at a piece of gold foil. Okay, so it's what we call the alpha gold foil experiment. Okay, here's my gold foil. He basically shot alpha particles at the gold foil. Okay. And the alpha particles, uh, if you recognize that alpha particles are the equivalent of helium, 
atoms, okay, so same as a helium atom. Then what should happen is the vast majority of the time, if this is going to work the way it should, okay, the vast majority of the time, those alpha particles would go, if they're being shot this direction, would go straight through the atom. Every once in a while, they would hit one of these currents and maybe slightly deflect. Okay, so he set up something to analyze the deflections. But what was ingenious about this is he didn't just set it up on the back half where it should have been. He set it all the way around just to see what happens. Okay, now what happened was that he chucked some alpha particles at this piece of gold foil. Here's my gold foil, right? And most of the time, they went straight through, right? So let's do a little bit of moment here. They went straight through the gold foil, woo! Or they slightly deflected. But every once in a while, since he set up this detector, they came directly back at him. And what he made the analogy of this as is if you thought of the gold foil as a piece of tissue paper, like that you wrap things with, <laughs> and you thought of the alpha particles as a cannon, shooting cannonballs at this piece of tissue paper. What happened every great once in a while is that the cannonball hit the tissue paper and came right back at you. That was not what he expected to have happen. And so because it wasn't what he expected to have happen, he said that there must be a central place of mass that can basically deflect this alpha particle. And he was right. It was called the nucleus, okay? So his model was a basic model that I just drew. This is kind of the nuclear model, where you basically have a nucleus in the middle and then electrons somehow around it, okay? What he did, which was quite brilliant, is he set two of his graduate students on to figure out what the nucleus was made of, because he knew that it couldn't just be protons. He said that there has to be something else in that nucleus to be able to deflect those alpha particles. And so he set on the case two of his graduate students, Hans Geiger and James Chadwick. Hans Geiger, you already know why he's famous, right? Because he basically came up with a counter for radioactivity that we, he named the Geiger counter, right? So Geiger did uh, an instrument piece of instrumentation that allowed us to measure radioactivity. James Chadwick, almost 30 years later, it was a very long time from when Rutherford first discovered the nuclear model. He kept on it, kept on it, kept on it. Almost 30 years later, he basically had enough evidence to call that other particle of the nucleus a neutron, okay? So, James Chadwick discovered neutrons. Hans Geiger was famous for the Geiger counter. Right? Okay, so two of the beginning models. We have a sense of what the, we knew that the plum pudding was wrong. <laughs> and that was one of those wonderful moments of scientific method. You think that you're going to prove something right, and indeed, in the midst of trying to prove something right, you prove it absolutely wrong. Love it. Love it. <sighs> Science at work. All right, so Rutherford knew that there was a nucleus, but he didn't know how the electrons were arranged. He said they're somewhere around the nucleus, <laughs> which was probably a pretty good idea of how it actually should be. So. What happened was Niels Bohr was doing experiments along the same time. He was doing something that you're going to actually do in lab, which is he was looking at uh, energized tubes of gas through spectrometers, or through a spectroscope. Okay, And when he found that, he found that he was observing atomic line spectra. Okay. The atomic line spectra can identify an element. 
Okay, so he was actually doing something that was very close to figuring out that um, I could identify a, a, an element just by looking at this spectrometer and analyzing the lines that come out from that particular, from the electrons jumping in that particular element, okay, between the different levels. And what he basically did was Niels Bohr said, okay, based off of the atomic line spectra, which we can talk about in a different uh, video, we'll talk about atomic line spectra and we'll talk about quantized energy and what Planck came up with. Planck was our, before Bohr, so he already knew that Planck uh, had already discovered that energy was quantized. In terms of what Niels Bohr said is Niels Bohr said, well, I'm thinking that these lines come up from energy jumps that occur when electrons go from lower energy levels to higher energy levels. And so therefore, I'm going to say that the electrons are arranged around the nucleus in a way that mimics what the planets do around the sun. So. I'm going to say that the electrons orbit the nucleus just like the planets orbit the sun. So here's my nucleus. And what he said is basically this idea that the electrons are going to orbit the nucleus just as the planets orbit the sun. And therefore, he came up with what we call the planetary model. He did a lot of things with this model. He talked a lot about this model. He said, I'm going to tell you how many electrons are in each of the orbits. We're going to separate orbits that have lots of electrons into separate levels. Those were called subshells that um, can be reflective of the fact that, you know, maybe you can't keep track of 50 electrons at once. So maybe you should have separate levels so that each of those levels is doable, right? So it, you have a level that has two electrons, six electrons, and so on and so forth. And indeed, his model is the one that many people still think of today. The unfortunate thing about his model, just since we're doing a basic model moment, is that he was wrong. Right? So what happened there is that a man, his name was Werner Heisenberg, He's more famous for being associated with the Nazi party than just about anything else. But in terms of what we need to think about with Heisenberg is he came up with something that was really super important to this discussion of atomic models. Okay, And that particular thing that was super important is he came up with this idea of the uncertainty principle. What did he say in the midst of the uncertainty principle? Basically what he said in the midst of this in the midst of this discussion is he said, well, electrons are not the same as planets are. Planets have a lot of mass. They have um, a large uh, momentum associated with them. And so, because they're so big and they're so, uh, they have such large amounts of mass, it is absolutely true that you can track in the midst of a planet exactly where it is, exactly where it's going, and how fast it's going that direction. So basically he said for a planet, you can find its position, where it is, and its momentum, which is a combination of mass and velocity and a directionality at the same time. It's totally fine. An electron virtually has no mass at all, <laughs> right? So the mass of an electron, if protons and neutrons are 1 AMU, then the mass of an electron is like 1 1,800th of that. Like take that number and divide by 1,800, and that's about the mass of an electron. It's ridiculously light. You can't possibly say for an electron that you know its position and momentum simultaneously. You know one or the other, but not both. Okay, so Heisenberg's uncertainty principle basically said 
it's impossible to simultaneously know the position position and momentum that's mass times velocity for those of you who are wondering with a it's a vector quantity so it has a direction with it at the same time. Oh no, simultaneously works. <laughs> At the same time is the same as simultaneously. Let's say that simultaneously know the position and momentum for something as small as an electron. As small and as light, because the mass was an important piece as an electron. All right. If it's impossible to simultaneously know the position and the momentum of something like an electron, then it is impossible to do orbits. That's the important piece. It basically sunk Bohr's model because you cannot do orbits if you cannot predict both of these at the same time. And so, the last model, the last model that we come to is Schrodinger's model. Now, a lot of people ask me, why did Schrodinger even get in this piece? Well, the reason why, and why do we, why do we always start this chapter off with light? <laughs> Those are the two questions. Well, Schrodinger was a mathematician. He was a mathematician that was describing wave functions. Okay, and that's actually why we start this chapter always off with light, because light has two things about it. It has uh, a duality in the way we think about it. Light is simultaneously both a particle, which we call a photon, and a wave. And we can think about those at the same time. That's called the duality of lights of light function, right? In terms of the way we think about electrons, electrons have an analogy as well in the midst of all of these models that we're considering. And the analogy is light. For the first models that we came across, all of the models we, we described so far, electrons are treated as particles. And the big piece today is they're not treated as particles anymore, they're treated as waves, just as light was. All right, so in this case, Schrodinger's model, which maybe we should put it, it's, it's really a new model, so it's like Schrodinger, Schrodinger's model of the atom is known as the modern model. Why is it called the modern model? Because it's what we use today. Schrodinger's model is mathematic, is, is a, is, he was a mathematician, right? It's a, it's a math, it's a model based off of math. And basically, the equation you're using is this one, where if you use an operator on a function, this is called the wave function. That's what that little psi is. Looks like um, Poseidon's you know, trident. <laughs> That's essentially what it is. That's why it's called psi. Okay, if you use an operator on this wave function, which is uh, basically a formula, and then you're going to get the energies back times that same function, okay? The idea here is that Schrodinger's model does not predict exactly where the electron is. It predicts a probability for where the electron is. In fact, that probability is about 95%. So 95% of the time, we hope that that electron, we think it is most likely that that electron is within a certain three-dimensional space. And that 3D space looks different depending on what subshell you're talking about, okay? So it has different shapes. And so you could have a sphere. That's where S comes in. You can have kind of a peanut, assuming that the axes, this should look like a better peanut here, but assuming the axes look something like that. Maybe this is 
relabeled axes, but you know, kind of this idea of x, y, and z. Sorry, I'll put the z up here. All right? You can get the peanut, and the peanut can be aligned on any of the axes. You could have, um, and here the axis would be kind of here. That's not perfect at all. Sorry, that should be way better. Should actually be straight up. <laughs> They're there. Sorry. I think I'm going to make it worse while we're making it better. All right. Mm, you get the idea. All right. So there are way better pictures on your book, in your book, I should say, of this stuff. There's Z. Um, there's overlapping uh, peanuts, which is not exactly how we conceptualize it, but you know, physical chemists don't get all angry with me, I'm doing kind of the intro version of this. So you're gonna get a peanut maybe there and maybe a peanut there. And then you could have overlapping Ds, okay? So, um, and I, th I think of this kind of as the sphere, the peanut, the daisy, and then there's a flower where you have overlapping daisies, okay? So it's kind of the idea, that putting it into perspective of what we actually care about not the names. What we really care about is that this represents three-dimensional space in which we think electrons exist 95% of the time. That's what Schrodinger's equation gives us today. And these would be overlapping in an atom that has multiple of them, so much so that in every book there's overlapping of these and it shows eventually a large sphere, which is about the atom that we had at the beginning. A circle with electrons in it, electron cloud with this nucleus in the center. That's a modern model of the atom today. All right, that's just the short version of all of this. We will go into way more depth in future videos. Until I see you next time, adieu.